Thank you so much for your time, Mbani. So you've got 14 years within the DA. You started off uh, as a youth leader when you were still in university. What makes you think that you can lead the party? Well, partly what you've just said. I've been in this party for 14 years. I've seen the different phases of this party. I've started off as an activist at university. I've been an activist once I left university, started the party's first branches in townships, uh, in Tuzumen and Awamashu, because I believed that we needed to reach out to greater communities and to grow our electoral strength and to show different people that the party could deliver for it. But I've also been a counsellor. I've been on the ground with people on their daily uh, service delivery needs. And I'm a two-time member of the provincial legislature. I've got the experience in terms of the legislative work that it takes to actually lead a political party. But more importantly, I feel at this particular moment, especially in light of the current leadership we have, I'm the best person who's most going to be relatable to South Africans of all ages and who really believe that South Africa needs a different trajectory forward. I think we're tired of the same kinds of politicians. I don't think I fit that mold, but I think I have enough experience and enough um, understanding of being able to take other people along with me in this journey that the DA needs desperately at this time. How do you plan to do that, just given the fact that you've just come out of a, a policy conference, which many have actually described as, as out of touch with South Africans, out of touch with the realities faced by the black majority of this country? Um, what are your views on the fact that the party has adopted a non-racial uh, policy to dealing with redress? So my personal view is that obviously everybody wishes that we would be living in a post-racial, non-racial world. That isn't the reality that I think most South Africans understand to be their daily lives experiences. I think that race is still ubiquitous with the way that we experience everything in this country. And as the leader of the Democratic Alliance, what I want to make people aware of is that we do not deny that race exists and that it has had uh, historical elements to whether it's healthcare, whether it's the cues that you have to wait for, whether it's the traditional leadership that you're still living under, whether it's the fact that you can access university or not, is still primarily based on the historical imbalances that happened because of your skin color. So this policy conference that just happened, I mean, I agree with the SDG goals because they're neutral goals around how we all plan on making the world a better place. But what I think we definitely have to do and what I'm going to be doing is writing to Helen Zilla to make sure that these particular policies go to the Federal Congress because it's not good enough that we have 200 people that decide the fate of the party. This is exactly what has gotten us to the place where we are, where we've seen electoral decline because we had a small group of people who decide on everything that happens. But he, sorry, but Helen Zilla says, sorry to jump in there, but Helen Zilla says that the Federal Council is the biggest or is the highest decision-making body in between conferences. And so the people who sit on that Federal Council have been elected to actually lead. So those are entrusted leaders making those decisions. What difference will it make if you take this to Federal Congress? Federal Congress is over 2,000 people. It's in less than 50 days that we have to be able to decide where we are going as a party. I don't think any leader that is serious about taking every single person along with them in this party and that is confident that what we've just passed is what everyone believes would hesitate to take this to the Federal Congress. I think it's absolutely necessary given the fact that we have just had a review uh, period and an organizational review report that said that the rest of the party doesn't always feel in sync with our top leadership to take it to them. And maybe nothing changes, but you want to give people the opportunity to have their voices heard and to be able to actually say what they believe is the federal uh, policy that we have decided on. And in fact, Helen is wrong. The federal Congress is the highest decision policy-making body of the party. And that's why I'm saying rather than limiting it to a small number of people, open it up to everyone who has a possibility of making a contribution at that level. And I think that that will help to really uh, unite the party around whatever it is that the Federal Congress decides, rather than to have a few people that have decided, which has been our problem really for the last few years. Would you then say that 
a lot of people would not, uh, within the DA right now are not satisfied with the outcomes of that policy conference. We know that going into that particular gathering, there was a sense that it will be a mere rubber stamping exercise, that these policies were actually crafted by Helen Zilla and her ally in the policy units, Gwen Nguenya, and that again, um, this is also setting uh, you know, the ground running for John Steenhuisen to actually take over the helm. Look, what I will say is that it's troubling to hear from our policy here that these positions have already been decided for two years and there's been, you know, sort of a shifting back and forth about them. Because to me what that says is there's really been a concretized version of what should happen. And whilst I'm a member of Federal Council and I think that the process itself uh, was not uh, prohibitive to the people that were on it, I still believe that you want the rest of the party to buy into what you want to do. And I cannot believe that either myself or John Steenhuisen wants to lead a party that might not feel in sync with what we've decided. And I say this particularly from a strategic point of view of when you have to be on the ground which many of our public representatives have to. If they do not understand, do not internalize what we have decided, then they cannot sell that. And that means that they cannot actually win the kind of voice that will get us into power to be the kind of people that could bring the policies that we believe that should be in, in place in any case. I want to touch on that because you've actually built structures in areas such as Umkanya Gotek, you know, in rural KwaZulu Natal. Now, how are you going to explain a non-racial policy to someone, Ukoko, who may have uh, lived under apartheid and suffered because of the color of his skin, and then you as the DA, you want to go and canvass her vote. How exactly are you going to do that? Well, this is why I've been saying that as the potential leader of the DA, whilst I believe that we all want a non-racial society, it's ridiculous to expect that people would understand that's where we are now. And if you want people to trust us, which is what I think is the biggest deficit of where the DA stands at the moment in the eyes of the majority of South Africans, you need to explain that you understand their lived realities. So I would definitely start off by saying, personally, as Bani Dudi, if I was uh, the leader of the DA, with the SDG goals that have been adopted, I would then try to really concretize them and try to itemize them into a stakeholder economy, which really tells people how you make the economy more empowering to them. So, so you're, example, not gonna, you're not going to use the same policy that was just adopted at your recent policy conference. You'd actually choose something else and explain it differently in terms of from a policy perspective. I think you can talk about how non-racialism is the goal that we eventually all want to have. But I don't think that it's realistic to go and campaign to people telling them that you don't understand that race is still a big part of their lives. And what I'm saying is my offer as leader is that, of course, I realize that race is still a very big part of what creates poverty in this country and what has created poverty for the last 100 years and that I have a plan that I think you can use along with the SDG goals which have been adopted by the policy conference that speak to how you could then really empower people whether that's the kind of spatial planning that you do in various uh, parts of the country whether it's the formalizing of the informal economy as I've said in my manifesto whether it's talking about how we bring economic hubs and we really allow businesses to have no taxes in places where there's basically no economy at all therefore trying to bring peri-urban and rural areas into the marketplace or various other incentives that you can give to business to do that and it falls broadly in the framework of what the SDG goals are which which is what I agree with. But what I'm saying is there's no point, I think, in South Africa of trying to sell people on the fact that the race doesn't exist. Because if race didn't exist, then people wouldn't hesitate to think that they could just walk into any marketplace, any business, and be hired as they are. So, so, so does this then make your job uh, your campaign trail more difficult, especially internally within the DA? I don't think so, because as I say, only 200 people made this decision. And so what I think is that my job is to get everybody in the party to understand that, of course, we don't want a racial society, but that importantly, we're not going to go out to South Africans and lie or, you know, sort of be euphemistic about their lived realities especially because they're not going to trust us. And if people don't trust you, they're not going to vote for you. And this is what I've been saying from the beginning of my campaign as DA leader, is that we need to be in these communities day in and day out, not just before the elections, but the entire time so that they actually feel that we are people that genuinely care for them and will service 
their communities. And if we can't do that, then they're never going to vote for us in any case. So whether you're talking about classical liberalism, which I think many people don't even understand in the South African context, or any kind of ideology, people on the ground don't necessarily care about that. What they want to know is what you can do for them and what you can do for them now. And so it's great to speak about being non-racial, but how are you putting money into my pockets at this particular moment? How am I making sure that my kids can get into school, my kids can get into university? And that's where I come in, because as it stands, I don't think that South Africans are going to necessarily understand what we mean as a DA. And I don't think that it's the way for us to market what we truly mean. So the outcomes of the conference essentially have a colorblind approach to policy and the issues in South Africa. Do you identify as black? Of course. So if you identify as black, how are you then going to campaign for, for, for the party and at next year's local government elections? It doesn't matter in what position you may be in within the DA. Well, I've always identified as black. I mean, there's no way that I can't understand that in the South African context. And I think that people are made up of various identities. So I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm into Star Trek, I'm into sci-fi, I'm into fantasy, I'm a mother. There's different identities that make up Kumba Ndudi as, as they are for different South Africans. And we are incredibly smart and are able to understand those complexities at one time. And so this is also why I have a difficulty with when we make the conversation binary about can you be black and do this, can you be black and do that. I'm a black woman who has had very unique experiences in South Africa because of being a black woman. And as somebody who's in the DA, in whatever position I'm going to be in after the conference, that is what I'm going to take forward, and that is my lived realities. In the same way that I don't believe in organized religion, but I talk to my ancestors and I speak to um, my sort of spiritual realm in the way that African traditions dictate, those things are still a part of me, even though I also identify as a social liberal who believes in the decriminalization of sex work, who believes in the legalization of marijuana, amongst a host of other things. And so we can be these individuals who are different. And I think for me, and why I'm running, is the DA needs to understand that more than just having it on paper, but having it in practice. And I haven't seen that as much in the party, and I want to bring that through. And it's not just being about black. It's also about what does whiteness mean in this country? What do... Uh, white people feel. And I think there's a terrible legacy of what we've seen with white people who are really uh, conscripted during the apartheid area who must have severe trauma of having to have had to go through the kind of process they did against their own fellow South Africans, sometimes not even maliciously understanding what was happening. And so when we speak about these negotiated shared values that we want, yeah. this new South Africa that we want, we have to look at the trauma of all sides of the equation. Um, and really take that into cognizance. And I think as a DA leader, leading from uh, kindness and empathy is what's going to get us there. Because All right, let's hold it just there for now, and then we'll, we'll come back after the break. We're still in conversation with the prospective DA leader, Mbali Ntuli, who is going to take us through why she believes she's the right candidate to take over as the leader of the official opposition. Mbali, we were just talking about race and uh, how you actually still believe that race is important to deal with redress. But let's talk about the issue of race within the DA. Um, recently, John Moody resigned and he said that, um, you know, the reason why he's leaving is because the DA he joined is no longer the same, but also because uh, the voices of black leaders within the party are being muzzled. Do you agree with him? I can't speak for every single black leader in the party. I think that the reasons that many leaders leave are complex. Everything from personality clashes with current leadership to the fact that maybe ideologically they no longer feel that they have a space to be in the DA. But certainly, yourself, but certainly what I would say is that I think that in the last few years it definitely has been the idea that dissenting voices or disagreements necessarily mean that you're an errant person or that you are ill-disciplined. And I think that that's the wrong tack for a political organization, specifically one that considers itself liberal to take. And the idea of debate should be incredibly central to our ethos as a party. And to have people feel that they can't raise their voices or that they need to fear or that they need to worry about disciplinaries because of that is, to me, the wrong tack for where the party should be. And that's why, as I've said on numerous occasions as leader, I want to really stop that kind of culture and to bring back a culture of 
the kind of people that can debate and have free reign in the party to really bring their voices. We're only stronger when we have more ideas. And there are plenty of people in our party that I know personally that have so many things to contribute but can't do so because perhaps they always don't feel like they have the mechanisms. And I speak for myself as somebody who has on numerous occasions raised things, but because it's been maybe to the ire of yeah. people that have been in political leadership at the time, I've really been ostracized and isolated. In 2017, you were actually charged for liking a tweet on colonialism. That was in 2017. And, 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 and I want us to speak about who is being feared within the party because there's this perception that it's Helen Zilla. She gets to get away with a lot of things because she gets to tweet about uh, colonialism not being all too bad. And yet when you like a tweet or a Facebook post, which is contrary to hers, you get charged. We know that, of course, she is facing charges, but the perception or the reality is that when a black leader decides to have what you've described as a dissenting voice, the treatment is different. How do you respond to that? Because um, even now we've seen Pumzila Van Dam tweeting to say that she didn't even know that she's being charged, and yet Helen says all of this is a myth. So, firstly, let me just uh, correct that particular notion. The charges against me in 2017 were a complete fabrication. There were a conspiracy that happened to me by the then deputy leader of the Western Cape, who told me, amongst many other colleagues, that he had been asked to charge me. Obviously, who had, who had asked him he did you? not tell me, although I have suspicions of my own, of who had asked him to charge me. And so he carried on this fabricated false charge against me, which dragged my name through the mud and really gave me a bad reputation within the party. But this did happen at the time of Helen's colonialism tweets. And what I had actually tweeted and Facebooked was that we needed some consistency in the party about how people were treated. Because I think that there's nothing wrong for people to be disciplined when they step out of line or when they bring the party into disrepute. But the minute that you start treating people as insiders and outsiders and having a situation where some people get treated differently you start to cause resentment in the party. And particularly in my case, I think that that was the situation. Helen, at the exact same time as me, was charged for her colonialism tweets. Nothing really happened to her. My tweet was a fabrication, or my Facebook life was a fabrication that had been made up by people months prior to ask the deputy leader then of the Western Cape to charge me when there was actually no charge. And it's these kinds of things that really bring... I think, a distrust of our own disciplinary and FLC processes. And it's why I've been calling since the beginning of my campaign that we really need to change the way that we go towards disciplining people because you can't discipline people just for having different opinions. But in that particular instance, it cannot be ignored that it's seemingly along racial lines. Helen is white, you are black. Well, I can't speak to the FLC and the FedEx at the time, but as I say, I think it's politicized, and I think that we need to neutralize that by putting people who are not going to be subjective to what is happening in the party, because I think that that particular FedEx at that time may have been a little bit more hostile to the voice that I had, and so voted accordingly to continue to charge me, even though it was something that was fabricated, and was particularly perhaps aware that Helen was a premier at the time, and that maybe it would have been more brand damage to charge her. But my point is, we need to take the politicization out of the disciplining process, because the minute you have it, you stop being able to um, indicate or to um, verify or to really get into the meat of who is being charged, but rather you look at their position and who they are in terms of their political capital. And that is wrong, and that is what I want to put it into the party. Because here I sit, the deputy leader who charged me has been promoted, he is leader, I had to pay significant financial um, amounts to clear my name and still didn't even get an apology from the party despite the then provincial leader even admitting to what had happened. And so for me, I understand politics and I understand hard work. So it wasn't an issue that I felt had to be incredibly publicized. But now that I'm running for leader and knowing that I know that this is happening to numerous people in the party of all races, I think that there's a fallacy that it's just black people of all races who are being targeted by people who are in factions and who have agendas. So there's it no is important. Of black leaders within the DA, according to you? I think there's an exodus of black leaders. But why would they leave? 
What is it within the DA for black leaders that is uncomfortable for them to stay? I know that Helen Ziller has recently said that when white leaders leave the DA, there's, there's no discussion of a purge. So one, why is it significant for when, when black leaders leave the DA? But secondly, what is it about the environment mm. in the DA right now that is untenable for black leaders? I find it interesting that Helen would say that about white leaders. I'm only aware of one white leader that has left um, in the recent past, to be quite honest. The rest have been fired or had their memberships terminated. But what I do think is very interesting is that black leaders have cited her as a main cause. I can't speak to their personal relationships with Helen Zilla. I know what my personal relationship with Helen Zilla is. Um, although it has been tense at times, it hasn't been something that I felt needed to make me leave because I understand that she is not the entire party. There are so many other people in this party who are incredible, who really make up the party and make you want to stay and fight in it. But I also understand that people have different levels of their own, um, I suppose, uh, end points of what they can take. But what, but what, is what the I environment do, like? I, I think the environment really is one where it is incredibly difficult to have differing opinions to the leadership. And that is why I think we need to have a change of leadership. That's why I'm running, because I want to start a new culture where people don't feel afraid for their jobs, where people don't feel afraid that if they are different or if they have different opinions, that they're going to be ostracized and isolated. I certainly think that that has been an environment, and so I don't negate what people are saying at all, but I don't think it's just black leaders. I think it's happened to colored leaders. I think it's happened to Indian leaders. I think it's happened to white leaders in the party. Anyone who has specifically gone against at some certain time, not just the federal, but even at their own provincial levels, structures of leadership that don't agree with them. And that is a bad environment to be in, and it has to be changed because we can't expect that South Africans are going to trust us to really be a party that is open and transparent and accountable if we can't do that internally. And so I do agree with many of the criticisms in this way, and I've said it myself, and I've said that it's something that I want to address as leader. So. In, during your campaign trail, you've basically said that the leadership, the current leadership, has been ineffective, um, and it's 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 on public record uh, the relationship you've had with the Pelenzilla. While you say that your your relationship has been tense, but it hasn't been enough for you to leave, do you think that her return in October 2019 will make your prospects to become DA leader more difficult? My election would be first. So if I win, Helen's election is only after mine. I mean, literally about a day after mine. But, yeah, but I'm talking about her being within the party now as you campaign to become the leader of the DA. Does her being there in that position of federal council chairperson make your, your prospects or your ambitions to become the next DA leader more difficult? Look, I don't think Helen wants me to be leader. And she still has significant political capital in the party. And Why so she will she use us. To be leader? I think we see the world very differently. And I think that our past indicates that we diverge on a number of issues um, and diverge in terms of the personalities. I think we would both still be able to be cordial with one another, but I think she has significant political capital to put behind somebody like John Steenhazen, who she seems to be supporting, who she seems to retweet, who she seems to, you know, indicate um, at functions that people should go and attend his, that are his political campaigning functions. And that's fine. She's well within her rights to support a candidate. I think she has a very bad record of candidates that she has supported. I don't think that she's always really great at being able to pick uh, what people really require I'm to have the cinema. My I'm talking about a lot of Helen's uh, candidates that she's had. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I'm not dependent on Helen's support. I think other people may be dependent on Helen's support. I'm running as somebody who is independent of Helen. And whether she's in the position or not, to me, is irrelevant. What's but you, going may to... not be in, so you may not be in need of Helen's support, but you've also acknowledged that she has significant political capital. Significant capital to actually, for an example, as you've alluded to, uh, push for John uh, Steenhazen to take over the party. Do you think also she's using her political capital to charge all the people People who may be in support of you taking over as DA leader? I couldn't say. I really have no information about what she's doing in terms of her position as federal chairperson. But what I'm saying is, 
as many people as she may have political capital for to support a particular candidate, there may be people that are completely against what she stands for now and may support me on that basis too. But the most important point is the campaign has to come down to who the DA believes is going to be the most electable and the most relatable outside of the party. It's very important what happens in the party for sure, and that's where Helen's main support is. But I think if people in the DA want us to go into the local government elections as a party that is seemingly different and is willing to embrace the kind of South Africa that is inclusive and can really have a growth trajectory rather than a status quo trajectory, people are going to have to see that that is really my candidacy versus a Helen Zilla who's been there, who's already been leader and is already back as chair and the candidate that maybe she's supporting, which is John C. Nathan. It has to be a decision of, do we want to stay where we are and the yeah. same, or do we want to try something new and grow and maybe get people who have never voted for us to really take a chance on us this time? Speaking of your growth trajectory, I mean, one of the things that uh, John Moody alluded to was the fact that the DA is actually not really interested in the black voice, and in fact, um, they want to serve a white minority. Do you think the DA has been disingenuous about what kind of party it's trying to become? Do you believe that, uh, for instance, under the leadership then of John Steenhazen, that, that the party would regress and actually wouldn't be a space for the black voice? I think it's difficult to make electoral predictions. But what I can say is that there are certainly people that I believe think that we should remain a strong opposition party with a very niche market of the Western Cape and really an opposition that is punching above its weight, uh, per se. Um, and I think that this is evidenced by the amount of backlash that the party internally received when we had four metros and where we were really just trying to find our feet. And it's always going to be difficult. But I found that there were many people in the party, particularly in leadership, that were vitriolic in their response to this. And I can't determine whether it was because now there was more than one center of power or because we were growing at a pace that was way too fast for people to be able to control. My particular view is that if the DA wants to remain relevant, if we want to make democracy in South Africa work, that is exactly the kind of ground that we have to be in. And we have to rope in every single South African who believes in the country going forward to come and join us and be on board. Whether that's as members or as academics or as intellectuals or as captains of industry, we actually have to be embracing more people to join us to try and grow the DA and grow our support base rather than trying to be niche and small. Will you be able to rope in all those South Africans given the backlash you've just received from, from your policy conference about the types of policies that you've adopted? I think it will depend on the leader that is elected at the Federal Congress and their ability to be able to reach across the divide to those South Africans. I personally think that I'm a better place to do that as the leader of the Democratic Alliance. I think that I'm young enough to know that I don't know everything and that I can take advice from various people, particularly people who have experiences in different fields that we need to be looking at in South Africa, and that I'm not as perhaps, you know, sanctimonious enough to think that I have all the answers. And I'm ready to get down and work. Where I'm very strong is on the ground and getting people behind the message. But I will definitely need help and I will be reaching out for help for the people that are already working in the private sector, in the academic areas, in climate change, in um, the work that has to do with GBV and you know, gender studies and um, everything else that is really happening in South Africa at, at this particular moment. And I really want the DA to be the kind of party that can be inclusive, that can take people along with it. And that's going to mean that we're going to have to actually speak to everyone. And if we can't do that, we're not going to get there. Bali, you've taken during your campaign trail quite a bold step and actually challenging your running mates, John Steenhazen, to four live televised debates so that South Africans and DA delegates would be able to see what both of you have on offer. Have you gotten a response to this uh, request? Well, let me start by saying I didn't think it was bold until I didn't get a response. So I hope that that answers your question. I thought that anyone would have been incredibly excited to put what their offer was both to the DA internally and to South Africans on the table. Um, it was only after I didn't really receive a response that um, I recognized that perhaps maybe I had been a bit more bold than I thought. And maybe let me be fair to say that the response I received from the campaign was that 
they would allow the party to decide, which I personally think is a cop-out. I think that the How party... Is that a cop-out? Well, there's no rule in the party that says that we can't debate each other's candidates. It's happened before, and it continuously happens in every single province. In fact, it is an integral part of democracy to have delegates hear what their leadership prospective candidates want to offer. Do you agree then with reports that say that the possible reason for why this request you've made hasn't been acceded to is because John Steenhuizen might fear actually going toe to toe with you when it comes to issues such as race? I couldn't confirm that on behalf of John Steenhuizen, but I would hope that those reports are not true because I think it would be incredibly problematic to have a leader of the second biggest party in the country unable to speak about something as ubiquitous as race to the entire uh, population. I think that there may be fears that the debates may get robust, but if anything, I think that's exactly what needs to happen if you want to see people... Uh, really going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the offers. And robust doesn't mean mudslinging. Robust just means that we both have very strong viewpoints of where we stand on matters. And speaking as somebody who has really um, loved the excitement of debates that have happened over our democratic past and in other places, I'm disappointed that in our Liberal Party that particular conversation seems to have been shut down. Running a campaign is not an easy task. It needs a lot of money. Are you willing to share where you are getting your funding from to undergo this process? Of course. And I think that that's something that's incredibly important for everyone to do. I've received numerous um, campaign donations from ordinary South Africans, some of them who have chosen to remain anonymous when they have contributed to my campaign. I've had family um, contribute and friends. Um, and I've contributed a significant amount myself because I truly believe in what I'm trying to do here. And really, whether I win or lose, I think that there's no loss in putting my money behind the ideas and the principles of what I think the DA should become in order to be the kind of relevant party that could become the alternative government in South Africa. I want us to plot a few scenarios about the win or lose, but uh, for now, you've actually spoken about the concerns that you have over the OPA system mm -hmm. that the DA plans to use during its October Congress. You've cited that you'd want to have an independent or third party auditor to come check the results, but the issue that you're having is that you won't know um, how many times a particular person would have uh, voted and who would have voted. You've written as well to Dr. Alvin May about these concerns. Have you gotten a response and just how nervous are you about using this particular OPA system? Look, Zianda, I consulted my own IT experts when I was told what system we would be using and they verified to me and the party has also uh, confirmed that there are a number of flaws in the system, particularly around the verification of who's voting, um, on the ability for how easy it is to transfer the links of emails and stuff to allow other people to vote. And then when you really are in an environment of fear and people believe that, you know, they should vote a certain way, anything could happen in that particular instance. But also importantly is the fact that myself and my campaign team won't have any access to being able to see where those votes are going when they are cast, particularly if they are online. It's a different story when it's in person. But online certainly becomes a problem. And I have written to Dr. Ivan Mayer. Um, I've written to him three times. I received an acknowledgement the first time, and I'm yet to receive clarity or feedback on the issues that I have raised. And so I'm going to continue writing to him, but I will admit that my campaign team is particularly nervous about entering into a campaign where potentially we don't know whether we need to have party agents or whether we need to be able to have people overseeing the system. So it's not something that we are feeling particularly confident about at this stage, but I don't want to say that the party is in any way unable to uh, clarify these issues once they are able to get back to me. Has this campaign trail been fair on you, given the political capital that you've already cited, that Helen Zilla has, and that she seemingly publicly endorsed John Steenhuizen, the fact that um, you know he would have access, for an example, to the donor list of the Democratic Alliance? Has this process been fair under COVID-19 regulations, under uh, you know circumstances where you actually need to reach out to uh, delegates virtually? I don't think anything is ever fair when you're trying to change the system. 
Uh, that's not to say that you know you expect that it shouldn't be fair, but I think when you're trying to change something, you need to expect that there's going to be some uh, advantages to people that are incumbents, firstly, uh, and secondly, that there's definitely going to be a pushback from people who don't want to lose power. And I think that that's expected in any kind of situation. So I don't ever enter into a fight or into a situation expecting it to be fair. Certainly my personal background has never indicated that anything in life is fair. Otherwise, I would probably be a lot further than I am now. But certainly I don't take that as something that is a deterrent to me. I think it's been something that my team and I have found many different ways to be creative around to continue to have the platform and the space to say what we believe needs to be said. And as for donors, I'll tell you something, a lot of them have contacted me personally without me having okay. contacted them. And it's been really refreshing to find that many of the donors of the DA actually agree with much of what I've been saying um, and have been incredibly supportive. Um, and are really looking forward to what this race is going to look like. So I think that the fallacy of understanding that donors are swayed a particular way yes. is not always correct. I think donors when and they people... Speak to with, you, what are they saying that they like about what you are saying versus what John has to offer? Look, firstly, I think I'm just a likable person. But secondly, <laughs> <laughs> I think that rich people are incredibly pragmatic. They want to keep their money. And how do you keep your money in South Africa? You make sure that South Africa continues to run. And you need to make sure that you have political parties that are able to keep the scales of democracy in place. And you can't do that if you have parties that are so irrelevant that they're never going to be in any way a feature or a protagonist against what is the current status quo, which would be our governing party. So I don't think that they necessarily think um, always everything I say or everything that you know, the current leadership says is correct. But I think that they're pragmatic about who will best be able to get South Africans behind a DA vehicle that is going to be inclusive? And I think in that sense, I probably have the lion's share. What happens if you lose this campaign trail? Are you willing to continue to serve in the DA under the leadership of John Steenhuisen? With everything that I've been through in the DA, false charges, numerous, uh, you know, isolation in certain aspects, there's absolutely nothing that has made me leave because I've always felt that it's important to try and change the party with internally. That being said, it's going to depend on how the party tries to continue its leadership. And I don't think that anyone should ever feel beholden to a party. What you are beholden to is a cause, and that cause is about making sure that South Africa actually works and is able to be a democracy that functions. So if I see that the leadership perhaps takes the party in a different direction that I don't think will achieve that. I feel very well within my rights after 14 years of giving up my life to this party if I need to, to walk away. But that won't be because I've lost the election. That will be because I feel that there's another way to better service the cause for South Africa. And I think it's very important that people realize that because there's no need for anyone to feel beholden to any political party because at certain aspects and certain times political parties can become the personalities of their leaders what happens you know what would be the last what would be the last straw for you to give up 40 to just throw away all those 14 years of your life and and where would you go you on numerous occasions have said that you know the DA is the only option uh, within uh, within the country so if you did leave what would that look like because many people also wouldn't be able to see Ambalin Tulu who is not in politics <laughs> uh, so I think that the DA for a long time was perhaps the only option alternatively I think that we are in an interesting space not just in South Africa but across the world where so many people are having the same ideas about how we need to have a different kind of change, a new way, as I've captioned my slogan in terms of my campaign, that with the constitutional court judgment that's come through, with the various positions that you can take up in civil society to take up some of these issues, there's numerous options for what you would be able to do, and not just as Mbani Duty, but anyone in the DA, because there are incredibly talented individuals in the DA. I don't know that there is a loss particular straw, but I think everybody at some stage needs peace and needs to just have some realignment with themselves and their own personal uh, goals and focus. 
And I mean, I ask this question numerous times when I speak to ANC people who have been there for decades, who really have truly believed what the DA and the ANC was fighting yeah. for, and they find themselves in a similar predicament. Do you stay and fight and try to change the system, yeah. or do you leave and start something new? And I don't think anyone really knows it until they are at that particular moment. So I'm not sure that there's a particular straw um, as mm -hmm. such. And it's not just for me as leader, I think for anyone in the party. Um, I don't know if there's any particular straw, but sometimes it's just an understanding in your own soul that it's a better time to just walk away.